Hello and welcome to Pictorial Planning. My name is John Finch. Today we're starting a new series on darkroom printing. We're going to cover all the steps to make really fine prints in the darkroom. But before we do this, we're going to have to take baby steps and learn some of the basics. This week, I'm just going to cover what equipment I think you need to make good enlargements. Next week, we'll use that equipment to make an enlargement and so on. And we're going to cover this over multiple weeks. So I hope you subscribe to the channel to follow this story. Thanks very much. Let's get over to the enlarger and check it out. So let's have a look at the equipment I use that I think is probably the basics of what you would want to collect together to do good darkroom printing. Now, there's a lot of extra stuff you can buy, which I won't be showing because I don't use it. And so I want you to just look at this video as perhaps kind of the recommended minimum of what you need to start darkroom printing. So the first thing you can see is here, I've got an easel. And I think when I first started, as I remember back, and remember where I first started with my journey in the darkroom, I remember that I didn't have an easel at all. And I used to print straight onto the baseboard like this. But I put a piece of glass on the baseboard because this allowed me to put my paper down on the glass and then move the glass around easily like this, moving the paper about until I got the crop and angle that I wanted for this particular print. Now that worked okay, but I was using RC paper in those days and RC paper is very flat. But now I use fiber-based paper because by and large, fiber-based paper gives a richer, better image when it's been processed. And I really like the look of fiber-based papers. So in this case, you really do need to get yourself some kind of easel. Now, this is a Bogan easel. There's various different kinds of easels, and I'm not saying one's any better than any other. But the advantages of an easel, of course, are that it holds the paper flat, first of all. So fiber-based paper has got a very slight bend to it when you get it out of the box. And by popping it underneath the easel here, the edges are caught by, by these, and it holds the paper nice and flat. This is also particularly useful when you're doing contact test strips because, um, not contact test strips, just test strips. Because it holds the test strip for you so that when you're moving your card across the test strip like this, it's not moving the whole test strip along with it. It's basically holding it down for you. And that's very useful as well. So yes, I would recommend, if you can, to get yourself a decent easel like this. It will help you make better prints. So the next thing you're probably going to need, and we haven't covered the enlarger yet, we're going to look at that later. But the next thing you're probably going to need is something to be able to focus the negative with. Now, some people I've seen try to focus by eye, and it's impossible to get accurate, sharp focus by eye. It's too dark, the image isn't bright enough, and there's barely enough contrast for you to really get that sharpness that you need. So to get the right sharpness, you need a grain focuser. Now this is the grain focuser that I recommend to people. It's a little bit more expensive, secondhand, but it is worth it. Now go over why. It's an Amiga, a micro Amiga grain focuser. Now it has a mirror here, which is covered by a little door to keep it uh, cleaner. And it has the magnifier here. But the thing with these Amiga microfinders is you can tilt this. And the reason that's useful is because you can actually focus right up to the edge of your negative and tilt this to get the grain in focus right up at the edges. And that is invaluable. It actually gives you a clue if your darkroom enlarger is misaligned because if this corner here is out of focus but this corner down here is in focus then I know that I've got something wrong with the leveling of this whole enlarger. 
So that is helpful. I do like this. I don't always go to focus my edges, but what I do is in order to find grain on a negative, sometimes you have to find a darker part of the negative, which is lighter in the print, because then you can see the grain more easily. So sometimes you have to move your focuser to try to find a darker place. And with this tilt mechanism here, it means that if I'm over here at a darker area of the negative, I can tilt this and get a full view of the grain around that area. Now, quick tip, if you do have one of these or any focus finder, here's a larger focus finder here. I'll put that down there for you. These both require you to focus this eyepiece here. And inside, as you view inside the grain finder, you'll see a, a crosshair usually, and you turn this until you focus that crosshair for your eye. And that takes into account any discrepancies that your eyesight brings to the, to the party. So this one's the same. You just turn this and you focus the cross, and then you know that the grain is going to be spot on focused. Why have I got these two? Well, this larger one here is much easier if, if I've got the enlarger up high. It means that I can get my eye down to it and still reach the focus knob. So that's why I have this larger one here. This is a, a Scopanet focus finder. So that's focusing. I think you really do need to have one of those if you're going to make successful darkroom prints. Now the next thing you're probably going to need is either a set of multi-grade filters. These are Ilford multi-grade filters, although I think Kodak do some as well, or used to do some. Or you can use a color head on your enlarger, and we're going to look at the enlarger later, and you'll see that I actually do use a color head on my enlarger. The next thing you're going to need for accurate exposure is an enlarger timer. Let's move the camera and get a better look at the enlarger timer here. This is my enlarger timer. It's a Patterson. It's a relatively um, reasonably priced timer. You can get much fancier ones than this from people like RH Designs and people like that. But honestly, I don't think you need one because this gives you everything you need to accurately time exposures. Now you'll notice that it's 9.9 .9 seconds. That's its default that it boots up at. And I can reduce this down. You can see it goes down in tenths of a second. And that goes all the way down, right down to one second, of course. If I hold down, it just goes more quickly. Now, if I go up to 10 seconds, and there it is there. When I go up now, it's in one second increments. You only need one second increments when you get past 10 seconds. If you think about it, the longer the exposure the more fine-grained each second is. And we sort of covered this when we were checking our film um, and doing test strips for our film ISO tests and our development tests. Do you remember we used three seconds and we just kept moving our uh, cover over the paper every three seconds? And that's because by the time it gets to 10 seconds and beyond, each second is a very, very small difference in the amount of light. So don't worry if your timer doesn't have decimal places after the 10 seconds, because honestly, you do not need them at all. Now, how do I work out f-stop printing, which is something we'll cover in later videos? Well, up here, I have a chart on the wall, and that's my f-stop printing chart. And I can look how many seconds, that I'm so here we have say 12 seconds exposure and I can see plus a third of a stop plus two thirds of a stop plus a whole stop and so on. So I use this chart to do my f-stop printing. It's again something that we'll cover in later videos about the darkroom printing techniques we're going to learn. So let me move the camera back and we'll talk about a little bit more equipment you might need. So obviously I'm going to need something to keep my negatives clean. So I have an anti-static brush, blower brush here, and I have a 
one of these blower balls, both of which I've used and I've shown in previous videos on keeping negatives clean. Very useful, use them all the time, and I think they do a pretty good job. I need a pencil. This is a propelling pencil, and that is what I use to mark the back of my prints. I record exactly how I've exposed the print, how, it w how the photograph was taken, um, what grade of uh, filter I've used on the paper and so on. I keep all of those notes on the back of the print using pencil. And the reason I use pencil is because it doesn't run when it gets wet. So very useful to have. Another thing that I'm going to need is some dodging and burning tools. So here is the kind of thing you can make up. You just get a piece of old wire. This was probably from a clo um, clothes hangers or something. And you just stick a piece of thick card on it, depending on the size of the dodging that you want to do. And here's a smaller one. And I literally have a couple like this pre-made. And then I have spare pieces of wire that I can attach other pieces to if I need a special shape. So again, it's something we'll probably see being used in later videos as I lead you through printing techniques. We're going to need a piece of card for burning. So if I want to burn the sky in a little bit, I would use a piece of card like this. And this is a very thick piece of card cut from the bottom of a Ilford paper box, actually. I talk about thick card and I mean it. You need thick pieces of card because you don't want any light to get through this when you're doing your dodging and burning. If you use a photograph or something in front, it's too thin and some light might get through and it's not going to be as effective. So do get a nice piece of card like this. Um, here's a little hole that I've obviously cut out of here because I must have been wanting to burn in some area of the print. So. I've got that in the corner there. So very useful. I make ten plates. Here's a template that I've made to allow me to set up my easel quickly to different shapes that I might want the print to be. So that's just an old photograph that I've drawn on. Um, I usually move the easel around, make a print, and when I've got it just the way I want it, I then put a piece like this underneath, pop it in, and then I draw around so that it's exactly repeatable. And finally, let's just have a look at my enlarger, because I would like to recommend this enlarger to everybody. It's got some really good features. So let's move the camera and have a look at this. So here's my enlarger. It's a Magnifax 4 and I really like these enlargers. I, um, I used to use Durst but when I found Magnifax I realized that these are built brilliantly. They're excellent enlargers. It's of course got changeable lenses so that I can use uh, 50 millimeter for 35 millimeter negatives and I've got an 80 millimeter for my 120 negatives. Your choice of lens will be up to you. I've gone for a Nikon lenses because I really like the quality of Nikon lenses, but there's other great lenses out there like Companon and, and lenses like that. Now the Magnifax has got a marvelous negative holder. So that's one of the first things I'd like to show you is this negative holder. So it's got anti-Newton glass, but, and it holds the negative absolutely flat inside of this holder. You can see the top glass and the bottom glass there is superb. Uh, it's adjustable, so you can adjust it for 35 millimeter and 120, like so. And it just slots in there very easily. And it's universal so that I can adjust the template around the negative at my leisure. So that's a useful thing to have with these Magnifax enlargers. I've glued on here the Meopter uh, filter settings so that I can easily make any filter adjustments that I need. But I think you can see at the back here, I also have filter settings on the wall. 
And these ones are precious because these filter settings maintain the amount of light coming from the enlarger. So I don't need to adjust my exposure if I'm using these. And whatever your enlarger is, I'm sure if you're using a color head like this, I'm sure you can get these online where people have worked out, calculated the exact filter settings for every grade whilst maintaining the same amount of light on the print. Here's my normal settings up here that I would use and adjust for my grades, the magenta and the yellow, of course. But this is a great thing that the Magnifax color heads have. And I don't know if any other enlargers have this facility. Please write down below if your enlarger has one of these, but it's a density adjuster. So by adjusting this wheel here, I can darken the whole amount of light getting down through my negative to my paper or lighten it up if I need to. So it's like a continuously adjustable density filter. And I find that so useful. As you'll learn when you're watching how I'm doing my printing, I like my print time, my exposure time to be between 10 and 20 seconds. That's a kind of a Goldilocks time. It gives you enough time to dodge and burn and there's no rush when you're exposing for 10 to 20 seconds. Those of you who's been, who've been exposing for one or two or three, up to five seconds, it's just too fast. You can't do anything to your print in such a short exposure time. Now, of course, you might be doing that because there's just too much light coming through from your enlarger head. So somehow you've got to cut that light down. You've either got to put some, some density filters in the way of the light or use a color head that has this adjustable density filter here. So Magnifax enlargers, highly recommended, fully adjustable, um, marvelous things, built like a tank. I love them. I wouldn't be without this. Well, I hope that was useful to you. It felt a little bit like what's in my camera bag kind of video, but I think that it's useful for you to see what I'm using in the darkroom so that you can get an idea of what you have or what you don't have, or in fact, better things that you have. And you can let me know about those in the comments below. So thank you for watching. A huge thumbs up to my patrons. I really appreciate you guys. And next week, I'm going to be putting out a big announcement.